Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Kappas, and today I am joined by my guest, Dr. Paul Goldberg. Thank you for joining me today. Hi, Dr. Kappas. Glad to be here. Yeah. Now, this is special for me, obviously, to be able to interview you as you were uh, one of my professors in school. So it's great to be able to talk to you now and pick your brain on some things. Yes, you suffered through me probably for two or three classes, and you're already become a doctor in your own right now. Yeah. It's uh, great how things come full circle like this. Um, so Dr. Goldberg, for those, who, for those of our listeners who aren't familiar with uh, you and your clinic, can you tell us a little bit about uh, your background? Uh, I know you've got a, a very interesting background. You've, you've delved in a lot of important areas of healthcare um, that I think our listeners would be interested to know about. Sure. I became involved in healthcare, uh, Dr. Coppice, due to having illness myself when I was a young man. I was at the time attending um, Ohio State University, studying law at the law school there, also doing a program in medicine with the uh, medical college at Ohio State. And I developed uh, what was diagnosed as rheumatoid arthritis. And being only 24 years old at the time and being told it was going to be a lifelong illness, I would be handicapped and crippled for the rest of my life didn't sit too well with me. And so I looked for uh, ways to get well. And I was lucky enough to start studying something called hygiene, natural hygiene. And I ended up going to a hygiene institute in Florida, later becoming the health director there and learning how to basically recreate my health rather than treating it, but by recreating it. Uh, after that, I returned to school again, but I decided to study chronic disease epidemiology. I was interested in people who had chronic diseases and how to reverse those conditions, not to treat them, but to actually reverse those conditions and rebuild their bodies. And so I spent some time attending the University of Texas Medical Center, uh, graduated from there uh, with a concentration in chronic disease epidemiology worked for the United States Public Health Service in Illinois for some time as an epidemiologist and mental health planner. And uh, then uh, went to uh, Life University where you also were a student. So I started there as a professor, taught uh, public health and clinical nutrition, later on gastroenterology. And uh, then I entered into private practice um, and uh, with a focus on working with people with chronic health problems, whether that be rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or ankylosing spondylitis or cancer, diabetes, we see all of that at our clinic. And that's what I've been doing for the past 40 plus years is uh, in addition to teaching as a professor is helping people actually reverse their chronic diseases, rebuild their health and what we call take a biohygienic recreative approach to rebuilding their health. Mm -hmm. So I work with people with a lot of chronic health issues, just as I believe you do largely with people with neurological issues. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and one of our, our main, I guess, crossover uh, patient subtypes would be uh, multiple sclerosis, as that is an autoimmune disease affecting the central nervous system. Um, in your approach, in your clinic, how do you, uh, how do you approach that? And I know it's, it's, you know, what we learned in your class is, you know, you kind of approach every uh, autoimmune disease um, in a similar fashion, as far as you don't want to address the disease name per se, or the diagnosis, you want to address the underlying condition. So in what ways do you, uh, do you manage that, I guess? Well, that's a, a very good topic and question you bring up there. So when I was in, at the University of Texas studying uh, epidemiology, there were approximately 40 different classifications of autoimmune disease, about 40 of them. And now, depending on, on the textbook you're looking at, there's somewhere between about 110 and 140 of them. That, that's a big change. And I, I do see these autoimmune processes as one long continuum where there's a difference between the way I would approach them and where most doctors will, 
is that I don't treat the disease name because a disease name is actually a name for the manifestations of the problem. It's not a name for We can have 20 patients patients with rheumatoid arthritis or 20 patients with ankylosing spondylitis and every single one of them is going to be different. So I don't reach into my file with a patient from which for clinic name. It's interesting, Dr. Coppice, when I first got into practice, thought that if I use the same things that I did to, to recover from rheumatoid arthritis, and I was also diagnosed with a lot, that would work for everybody. And indeed, some people, but uniformly did not. So I had to learn that each patient that came in was a whole new set of a person. It was their own person. And they had to be taken on as an individual. So if the person's name was John Smith, patient's name, then we have to develop the John Smith program. And that's the only one that's going to work for them. So in terms of multiple sclerosis, there are certain things that, and commonalities, I think, that exist. But for the most part, here too, each patient is different from the next. It's interesting, you know, you talk about that. One of the first chronic diseases I talked about when I was at the University of Texas School of Public Health was multiple sclerosis. As an example, epidemiologically, because it exemplifies the fact that as you get farther from the equator, that disease is seen less and less and less. And as you get closer to the equator, the frequency of it becomes greater. And if you look at other so called autoimmune disorders, this, the same is true. And there's a very good reason for that. And that is that the more sun exposure people generally have, the less you see of many of these autoimmune disorders. It's not the only reason people get it or don't get it, but it certainly is, is, is a large factor. And back in the 70s, uh, when I worked at the Hygienic Institute, uh, we were taught about how important it was to get more sunlight, the sunlight exposure. And that's, that's true today. And unfortunately, um, our culture which has gotten this idea primarily from the medical establishment, is that sunlight is something to be feared. If you look back at textbooks, uh, medical textbooks from the 1930s, 1940s, even farther back the 1920s, all the way up actually to the late 40s and early 50s, you'll see them warning about anybody that's sick is supposed to get out of the sun. Sick people are supposed to go into, to be sequestered, go into dark rooms, and uh, don't, no fresh air and no sunlight, which is actually something that a, a lady named Florence Nightingale, a nurse, fought against uh, back in the 19th century. So it, it's interesting today where we're having people also who have sequestered themselves from the COVID-19 virus. And one of the things I wish that the uh, politicians would do is tell people there are things you can do for yourself other than just going hiding in a dark room. You can get out and get fresh air and you get sunlight. And we now know scientifically that sunlight has a number of different actions on the body, hormonally, uh, biochemically, that increase the balance of the system and make that person much more resistant to either acquiring the virus or if they do acquire it, to be able to overcome it. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's what I wanted to allude to. Um, we know how important vitamin D is, and that's something that you reinforced in your class over and over. And now it seems we're supposed to eliminate that almost completely from our lives uh, to prevent getting the virus, whereas you know vitamin D is actually something that may help us resist it and fight it. Yeah, well, part of the reason is I'm glad you called vitamin D because that's part of the problem. The medical establishment and the dietitians have led us to believe that sunlight is just the equivalent of vitamin D. And you can get so-called vitamin D from, from capsules. And it doesn't do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Sunlight has many, many ramifications on the human body, most of which we probably don't even know what they are yet. 
So by definition, sunlight's not a vitamin anyway. I mean, vitamin by definition is something you have to get from your diet. Mm -hmm. And the development of cold calciferol or 70 hydrocholesterol, which is what sunlight is transmitted into, is not actually a vitamin because you don't need to get it from a food. It's mm -hmm. available right from the sun. And I think in, in future years, they're going to see more and more aspects of how sunlight plays an important role in many aspects of the body mm -hmm. outside of its role in so-called vitamin D, just vitamin D. Yeah. And um, as an epidemiolo epidemiologist, as well as somebody who spent a lot of time in the hygienic world of healthcare, uh, some, that's where you live, really. How do you see the way that uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has been managed? Well, yeah, it's a loaded question. Good question, though. Um, I have some context still within the uh, professionals who work within the United States Public Health Service and the CDC. I'm 70 years old, so I, you know, a lot of them are now retired, but I still have a few. And when I... I've talked to a few of them um, who are still actively employed in the public health, in the public health sector. They say that at the CDC, U.S. Public Health Service, that there has been a big increase in the number of Ouija boards that have entered into the, the rooms there, <laughs> which, which says that although they, they bring forth a, a, a face, a presentation where they seem to know what they're doing, there's a lot of questions about what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And most of what's being done is based upon what's called modeling. In other words, well, based upon this statistic and that statistic and what we've seen from other epidemics or pandemics, this is the, the model we ought to use. There's a, a much more global aspect to this whole problem, though, is, and that is, why did this happen in the first place? How did this start? And is this a new entity all of itself, or is this just part of something that has been ga a gathering storm that is now starting to erupt? And that's the way I view this, that the outbreak of so-called COVID-19 is not by itself just an isolated incident. It is a, a beginning of the manifestation of something globally wrong with the way human beings have interacted with each other, and interacted with the planet overall. And a couple of the things that people have talked about is, uh, is this a result of um, somebody trying to create a biological threat in the laboratory? I have no way of knowing whether that's true or whether it's not true. And perhaps that could be a part of it. Another aspect is, is this a part of what happened in China with these so-called wet markets, these uh, wildlife uh, wet markets. And again, I have no way of knowing with certainty, but I would say there's a probability that that probably did have something to do with it. Because if you ever see these markets over there in China, um, they're horrendous. They're just, they're horrible. They are, I have no word to describe them. They take these wild animals, they put them in very small cages. They raise them under the most horrific conditions you can imagine. They, uh, then people come and there's snakes and bats and rats and dogs and cats, and the animals suffer terribly. And then oftentimes they are butchered in terrible ways as well. And one of the things that goes into some of the psyche among a, a limited group of Chinese people is that the animal suffers more, that the meat is more tasty. So some of these animals undergo being skinned alive and being tortured in ways that cause a great deal of pain. And there's hardly anything humane about that. In addition, the hygienic environment of where these animals are raised and where they're sold, it just constitutes a depot of uh, a reservoir of where disease can spread from. But it's not reflective of just what's going on in the Chinese wet markets. We have here in the United States this tremendous dependency on these uh, on factory farms, producing not thousands, not hundreds of thousands, not millions, not even tens of millions, but hundreds of millions of animals every year with millions of animals being slaughtered daily, again, under horrific conditions, not what they would be in, living in the wild. And trying to process their flesh, bringing it to the marketplace, 
raising these animals under crowded, congested conditions and thinking that there would be no outcome from that. Doing it year after year after year, larger and larger is a meat being processed every year. More and more animals being crowded in cages and cattle pens and being given antibiotics and hormones and uh, raised under terribly inhumane conditions. And thinking that there would be no outcome of that, that there would be no consequence of that, to me is just foolish. Then at the same time, Dr. Kalpas, there's something else going on globally too for some time, and that is an explosion of the human population. You can barely go anywhere on the planet now without seeing evidence of human culture, human society, human population. We basically uh, become, we have become the dominant species of the planet. And every nook and cranny we now habitate, and where we don't habitate, we're either raising our own crops there, we're raising livestock, we're doing something with it. We're using millions and millions and millions of pounds of pesticides and herbicides. There's human waste, which is now difficult to dispose of. We have an, an area of the ocean the size of the state of Texas, which is now a floating island of plastic. Um, to think again that we can pollute and overpopulate the planet to the extent we have done and that there not be a consequence of that, to me is both foolish and it's just illogical. So I think that the COVID-19 virus and any other virus and other viruses are coming around because remember this is the first one. We had the avian virus, we had the swine flu virus, there's other ones. Um, to think that this wouldn't happen would be kind of naive. And I think this is the first of many. The next outbreak might be next season. It might be two years from now, it might be five years from now, I don't know. But I think it's time that we open our eyes and look and see we are doing things to the ecology and the environment of the planet by being the dominant species, by not being careful about the way we behave, that's now going to come back and basically bite us in the rear end. And it's, going to have, it's, have, it's now beginning to have consequences that we can very clearly observe. Yeah. So I think a lot of the response has been very short-sighted and I guess acute looking at uh, what we can do as a next step. But you're looking at the bigger picture overall. How did we get here? You know, where do we go from here? How, I guess, how do we change optimally so that this doesn't happen again or we reduce the risk of this happening again? And is it feasible in the current climate where it seems like efficiency is king and the, I guess the, uh, the environment is not really considered as much as it should be? Yeah, well, I, I, I think a really very good question you asked there too. I think there's two ways of looking at this. One is we certainly have to take care of people that get sick. And people that have come down with this virus, the majority of whom are not affected that much by it, but those who do have serious ramifications with it, which would include the elderly and, and or those people with some type of pre-existing condition, they have to be cared for. And I think that using some type of isolating uh, techniques uh, in order that the whole population doesn't become uh, infected with this at one time, simply for the, for the purpose of limiting the number of people that are going to have to go to the hospital, is a wise thing to do. At the same time, longer lasting, we have to look at ways of uh, being careful not to create the right conditions to generate good health, both for us as individuals and for us as, as a species and as a planet overall. And when I work with people, and again, most of my practice has to do with working with people with uh, autoimmune disorders and other degenerative conditions, chronic degenerative conditions, one of our main emphasis is uh, with my uh, colleague, Dr. Tenor, who uh, shares the clinic with me, is to create the right conditions for that person that health then becomes manifested, that supports good health. So as opposed to treating disease, which means uh, drugs and therapies, and by the same token, you know, even the so-called 
alternative medical, medical practitioners and functional medical practitioners, they're still using treatments at various times. They're just, you know, don't give them aspirin, give them willow bark. You know, but you really look at the same thing. We're treating, we're still treating symptoms, mm -hmm. which is why I don't view myself as being a medical practitioner nor an alternative medical practitioner. We talk about doing a recreative uh, biohygienic approach to disease. We're really trying to recreate that person's cells, give them a new body to the fullest extent possible. And that means creating the right conditions for that person to manifest that. Mm -hmm. So, what are the things we know that create the right conditions? Well, some of them are pretty well known, just not well employed all the time. We talk about sunlight, fresh air, having adequate space for every person, having a, having a proper dietary, um, getting proper sleep and rest, um, having a good mental attitude. These are all things, you know, you learn, you know, when you learn these when you were in chiropractic college. But the employment of them is, some, is something else. And we also have to look at this from a public health perspective. When you start crowding people together, just like you crowded fruit flies in a jar, you're going to generate a lot of waste products. You're going to limit the amount of food that's available. And you just don't have room to, for good health to be produced in that way. So we have a lot of serious questions to ask ourselves about the future of the human species on the planet what continues if we go from when I was born um, there was about 2 billion people on the planet okay. that's a lot of people 2 billion is a lot of people mm -hmm. and now we have almost 8 billion people on the planet yeah. Went from less than 2 billion over to 8 billion you know in a period of about 70 years and we can't we can't sustain that, that type of ongoing growth I would be the last one to want to say, okay, you can only have so many children. I think individuals need to start thinking about this uh, and planning their families so that everybody who wants to have children can still have them, but trying to limit population growth voluntarily. To some degree. And at the same token, the, the way that we live, we have to think about what type of waste materials are we producing as individuals and can we be more conservation minded in the way that we do that? Mm -hmm. And along with us, that I think reminding ourselves that we're not the only species on the planet. The other animals share this planet with us and they have a right to coexist and, and enjoy a certain amount of peace and harmony for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Goldberg, we, we talked, uh, you really covered the macroscopic perspective of this virus and what we have to do from a global perspective. What are some things that individuals can do um, on the microscopic level to really ensure that they're living a more hygienic, um, hygienic life, you know? I really like the quote, uh, don't be a good host to a bad guest. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and uh, I, th I think uh, that's kind of what the question I'm alluding to is how do we become a bad host to a bad guest? Okay. I think one of the things in general that we can do, and I use the term um, that we have as a, as a species, we've kind of disconnected from the planet. We no longer have the strong connections with the planet we once did. We used to basically and literally have our feet and hands in the soil we drank water that ran through streams. We ate food that came directly from the ground. And we have disconnected ourselves from the, from the planet in a lot of different ways now. From the time that we're born, we basically do everything we can to avoid exposing ourselves to germs, including bacteria and viruses and fungi and parasites. And certainly I'm in all in favor of good hygiene. That's important. There was a fellow uh, named Thomas Strachan, still alive as far as I know, at the London School of Tropical Hygiene, um, sorry, it's London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And Dr. Strachan back in 1989, I believe, wrote a thesis, uh, a hypothesis. He came up with a hypothesis that became known as a hygiene hypothesis. And in this, he postulated that one of the main reasons that we have so much degenerative disease among people the, the cancer, the diabetes, 
the rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and ankylosing spinal arthritis and psoriasis and chronic fatigue, and all the other things that I see daily in practice, that we work with patients to reverse, that this has, in, at least in part, come about with come about because we've disconnected ourselves from the planet. We live such highly sanitary lives where we no longer have our hands in the dirt, we're not exposed to sunlight, we're not out in fresh air, and specifically in terms of what Dr. Strachan talked about, we're not exposed to a wide range of bacteria and other microorganisms. Our immune systems, when we're born, they are by nature very immature, and they have to be built they have to be constructed. They have to undergo some battles in order to reach full maturation and full stability. And when we isolate ourselves from the outside world such that we don't have contact with those bacteria, we don't have contact with those viruses, then our immune systems grow up rather sheltered. And then when we get a little older and then we come into contact with a virus or a bacteria, the immune system, having not gotten used to that, having not developed the proper accommodations towards it, not just reacts, it overreacts. Mm -hmm. And I think that in part is why we have so much of this autoimmunity that goes on today. And I, as we talked about at the beginning of, of, of this uh, meeting, that um, this interview, that more and more autoimmune diseases are now being labeled. And so what we can do is just simply get outside Get out of the fresh air, get out in the sunlight. I think one of the, the greatest things you can do for your health is to have a garden. And if you go back even 50, 60 years ago, a lot more people had gardens than they have today. 200 years ago, virtually everybody had a garden of some type. Yeah. And you go back a thousand years ago, and really everybody did have a garden. And there's a lot of people who go back a little farther, they were hunters and they were gatherers, and everybody was living off the land. Well, we don't have that today. If you go out there and you garden, you first of all get the exercise, you get the fresh air, you get the sunlight, you get the harvest itself of wholesome foods. But in addition to that, you're actually in contact with the earth. I, um, I love animals and I have uh, my, part my particular dog that I particularly like, I have rescue dogs. But my rescue dogs are all either Jack Russells or they're Jack Russell mixes. And one of the things I love about Jack Russells uh, other than the fact that they're kind of hard and they're small like I am, is that they, they like to dig and they like to get in the earth. And uh, at, at the beginning of the day, when I let them out, we all go outside, they're pretty clean. By the end of the day, you can't recognize some of them because they've, they've gone from white to tan and they're all brown at that point because they're all been digging around all day. And I have uh, nine acres and you have to be careful where you step because you may step into a Jack Russell hole somewhere or another. <laughs> This is one of the ways that the dogs keep themselves healthy. I mean, you don't see, my dogs never come, I, I can't even think of when any of them have come down with infections because they are always being exposed from a young age and their immune systems have met that challenge and they're used to being exposed to different things. Uh, one of mine, uh, Jack Russell's little female named Junebug, came in the other day and she was digging around and she came in and on her, her, her muscle right above her nose, she had a large cut there and she'd been digging all day with that cut there. It was bleeding a little bit and dirt had got into it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't terribly alarmed. I was concerned and I cleaned it for her. Um, but she was out the next day and uh, getting dirty again. And it's healed up just fine despite that. Maybe even because of that. Now, should people go out and open their open wounds and put dirt in it? Of course not. But being exposed to a number of bacteria is one of the most important things that we can do. And people think, well, that means I should take things like probiotics on a regular basis. I was a, the senior director of a probiotic company. I was a director of research, but I'll be the first one to tell you that that's not the most important thing you can do. Taking a bunch of probiotics, well, we use them occasionally, but they're not the most important thing. The most important thing is just getting out there, being in this, the world of nature and God, and being exposed to everything that's out there in a reasonable fashion. And at night, the nice thing about living in the 21st century, you can retire, you can put yourself through the shower, a nice warm shower, and you go to bed between clean sheets. And I am all for washing machines, dryers, toilets, and showers. I love indoor plumbing. But in the day, I think we, just like any other animal, needs to spend some time outside, get in contact with bacteria from a very young age, 
limit the number of disinfectants that we're using in our houses, where we don't let the kids, you know, the kids can't go out and make mud pies and things anymore. Hell, let them get out there. Let them make some mud pies. Let them get exposed. That's the best form of immunization they can have. But rather than do that, the kids are cloistered. And, and not just because of the back of the uh, COVID-19, we're keeping them cloistered, I think, before that. And the kids don't really get exposure to the outside world. And then supposedly, perhaps to make up for it, we're giving them a huge amount of vaccinations. The whole topic of vaccinations is a whole topic unto itself. But one thing I think I can say without any, hes any hesitation, without reservation at all, is the number of vaccines that we're giving kids is not slowly introducing them like the natural world does of various bacteria and viruses. It's literally injecting them with a huge amount of foreign, exogenous, toxic materials and overwhelming their immune systems at a very young age. When I was a kid um, growing up in the 1950s, most of us received probably about four or five vaccinations. Now that the kid has reached his teenage years, they've had approximately 72 different vaccines. That is far too many for the human body at one time anyway. Even if you, whether you believe in the um, efficacy of vaccines or not is not the question here. It's whether you're just simply overwhelming the, the immune system in a way that is not, the way that the immune system does not normally maturate. And I think that you're seeing a lot of problems that are occurring as a result of that. Mm -hmm. And we, we started this talk about MS. I'm not sure that in some patients that having had a, a load of vaccines when they were very young, I don't know that it's a, it is the cause of it. I don't believe it is the cause, but I believe it may be a contributing factor to the total load, and that's the term I use, the total load of, of things that people are exposed to that lead to the development of some of these chronic conditions like uh, multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about uh, the virus um, earlier and how people may or may not be more predisposed to, I suppose, contract the virus and the way we live our lives um, kind of determines or helps or hinders us from fighting off the virus. You really focus more so in your clinic on chronic illness, whereas this COVID-19 is more of an acute illness. How do the, I guess, the, uh, the ways we live our life, lives, how do they contribute to these chronic illnesses and autoimmune diseases? Sorry, that wasn't the most eloquent way to ask that, but I guess that's what I'm alluding yeah. to. Well, remember that the people that are most subject to having really dire consequences of this virus are those that have some type of long-term chronic disease prior to coming into contact with it. Yeah. So I don't necessarily see there being a clear-cut line between infectious disease, the sequela of that disease and chronic diseases. It's, in some ways, it's, it's a long continuum. In, in the transition, if we look at people, the patients I've seen over the past 45 years who have chronic diseases, while some of them may think, well, this ankylosing spondylitis, this rheumatoid arthritis, this multiple sclerosis, it just started to affect me six months or a year ago or two years ago. That's when it started. But if we look at the history of that person, and uh, I think that you know that doing a very thorough history on a patient is the most important thing that you do. You know, we have uh, your history and your physical exam and your laboratory testing, and all three of them are very important. But I think the most important thing we do as doctors is is hopefully take a very very thorough case history. And in our clinic, Dr. Tanner and I go all the way back to their birth. We spend at least an hour with every patient just going over the initially going over their case history and you find in these patients coming in and, and really 100 percent of the patients i see do have a chronic disease of some type the disease in the patient's mind may have started just a year or two ago but if we go back we see the roots of it oftentimes beginning all the way from childbirth from the time that they were very very young they have 
they have sowed the seed, sown the seeds for the development of Crohn's disease for many, many years. So they had a series, they had colds, they had flus, uh, they had bronchitis, they had um, sinusitis, they had allergies, they had different things happening all along. And then after years of dealing with chronic sinusitis or chronic uh, ear infections or chronic indigestion, which were considered you know, minor problems, chronic fatigue, then they wake up one day and their joints are all sore. Or they wake up one day and they're having neurological problems as you see at your clinic with people with neurological deficits and they're having trouble with their balance and they're having trouble with ambulating and so forth. Those problems didn't just start. They had a history too. They often, they almost always start with acute disease gradually degenerating into chronic degenerative disease. The seeds were planted long before that diagnosis of multiple sclerosis or rheumatoid arthritis, whatever it might be, uh, came up. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we have to tell the person, no, your disease didn't just start. It just got to the point where the body has basically capitulated and is no longer able to mount an adequate defense in the form of an acute disease. Because when you get the flu, for example, or you get a bad cold, your body's, let's use the cold as an example. When your body gets a cold, it's basically saying, look, I'm worn out. I've gotten somewhat toxic. And now this virus has come off and I'm gonna use that virus as a way to eliminate a lot of waste products and to force you to slow down for a while. I want you to, to rest. I, I'm gonna take away your appetite. I want you to stop eating. I want you to unload what's there. Most people don't do that. We've all been guilty of it. We just keep pushing on because we have work to do. We have families to take care of. We have careers we're building. And so we go through the cold. Some people even go and then they keep working out if they go to the gym. They do what they, they keep up their normal life and then they're very uh, proud of the fact that they made it through that all of that. But what happens is they've missed the opportunity to unload the toxic load, the fatigue load, the lack of energy load that they've had and get rid of it so that they can move forward. Mm -hmm. And it noted that if you have a cold and you really take care of yourself during that time, you use that, you know, it's a week or 10 days and two weeks maybe, and you use that time to rest and sleep and you don't eat very much, you drink lots of liquids, you take it easy. When you're all done with that, three or four weeks later, you not only feel back to normal, so-called normal again, you actually feel good. <laughs> you actually feel refreshed because your body has used that opportunity to unload that toxic load. So for these chronic diseases, whether it's multiple sclerosis or any other chronic degenerative disease, they rarely are going to have their etiological factors occurring just overnight. It's usually been a long scenario that has led to the development of that. And likewise, in working with that person to recreate a new body, we're going to have to dig into those cells and unload all the factors that have led to the development of that disease. So in our clinic, rather than treat that disease, we're going to re try to recreate those cells. And that means it's going to involve some detoxification, a lot of probe as to why that disease developed in the first place, and a restoration of energy to those cells as well. Mm -hmm. well I'm, I'm glad you brought up your clinic again because I wanted to know or wanted you to discuss a little bit about what a patient can expect uh, when they contact your clinic and if they choose to uh, seek care with you and Dr. Tenner. Yeah, um, it's a different kind of place. And the practical philosophy that I have used over the past 45 years is different than other clinics. I don't use any form of treatment with patients. It's going to involve three main things when they first come in, and that's going to be a, a, a case history, as we just discussed, which will take about an hour, a physical examination, which is pretty standard, and then uh, laboratory testing. We use both standard and functional laboratory tests. Then we take those three components together, and we have two doctors, and myself and Dr. Tenner, that work with each new patient, and we develop an individualized approach for them. And basically, this is to help them transform their body 
from a state of illness to a state of health. And that means not treating their symptoms at all, but working to literally recreate their tissues. To, in a sense, you've heard about people being born again spiritually, we're trying to help them be born again physically. And that means we have to go into those cells, we have to unload the toxic burdens that they're covered, that they have. We have to examine very carefully with the patient what they did or what was done to them that led to the development of illness to begin with, and then put them through a series of steps to help them unload the present cellular uh, problems that they have and rebuild that cells, literally rebirthing their cells again. And that's a process that um, is different than what most patients are used to going through. Most patients, when they go to a clinic, are used to being very passive. They go to the medical doctor and they get, they get their drugs and they move on. Uh, they go to the hospital, given drugs, or they, have, they lie on an operating table and they're operated on, and they move on. Um, even in the chiropractic office, you go to somebody, they lie on the table, and the doctor works on them. There's not a whole lot of involvement that they do. And our protocol is the patient has to be very, very actively involved because we're not treating their disease, we're actually helping them to recreate the body. So that's a, that's a whole different mindset that patients have to be prepared for. They're going to be active participants. We work with them as partners. And the process is going to be one where when they're done, we're not just saying, okay, you're done with this and now you wait until the next symptom comes about. The patient has learned what to do to get well, and now they know what to do to stay well. Uh, a very simple adage that I use is that real health care, real health care is self-care. And so we're, we do help the patient get through their chronic illness, revitalize their body, get rejuvenated. And if they go to our website at goldbergtenorclinic.com, they can see pictures of before and afters. We have about 150 of them. There are videos showing patients undergoing rejuvenation. And uh, when those patients, when we're done with those patients, they're not only well, but I think the real beauty of it is we have taught them what they need to do in their own case in order to stay well. So that to the greatest degree possible, they can become their own doctor. Mm -hmm. So after they leave your clinic, they have the, the skills and the assets to continue the progress that they've made uh, down in Georgia with you. That's my hope. And I, I and gen, generally that is what happens. Yes. Yeah. And if uh, any of our listeners wanted to find out more about your, your clinic, uh, where would they go to do that? They just go to www.goldbergtenorclinic, G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G-T-E-N-E-R, clinic.com. There's our website. And we have, it's a pretty large website. It has uh, information about our clinic. There's information about our, our practical philosophy. It has lots and lots of pictures of uh, patients before and after, along with testimonials from patients uh, with their names, along with what they happened with them. And we have it divided into certain categories for people because they're always interested in what disease they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's our care for the patient is always based upon that person, not the name of their disease. Yeah. Um, thank you. Dr. Goldberg, we are just about out of time. I know I've taken up a lot of your time uh, today and we've covered a pretty wide breadth and depth of, uh, of information today. Uh, is there anything that we didn't cover today that you want to make sure uh, you leave our listeners with? Uh, no, except I think uh, it would be appropriate probably to have you as a guest on one of our podcasts after this, shortly oh, after, because yeah. I'd like to hear about what you're doing as one of my former uh, students and somebody who also went to the same undergraduate school that I did at Bowling Green State University. Of course. <laughs> and, uh, I, I always have, have a deep uh, respect for the work that you do in helping patients with their neurological problems, taking a functional neuro neurology uh, perspective on this. And uh, so I'd like to uh, grill you a little bit as well. Yeah. Hey, I'd love to do it. I'd be honored. So. You're in Chicago, right? Is that your office you're sitting in or is that, that your home? Where are you at? Uh, yes, I'm in the office right now. We've got our nice, uh, our nice backsplash for these. Up oh, that is good. Yeah, we have a retreat center. I'm actually sitting in our retreat right now. We have a clinic which is in Tyrone, Georgia, which is just south of Atlanta. And then we have a retreat out in uh, Brooks, Georgia, which is a little place I have a little 
kind of a used to be a little horse farm, but now we have a nine acre retreat center where we do some some of our patient education. And uh, Joseph, I thank you for the opportunity to be with you and your listeners today. And I look forward to uh, being on the other side of, of an interview with you shortly. Looking forward to it. Well, okay. thank you. And from you. Uh, your host at the Neuro Wellness Podcast, be well. Thank you.